Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Putin. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Malaysia was recently found to have had among the highest number of research publications in predatory journals. Pred predatory journals are uh, those that tend to publish low quality science and deviate from best practices in academic research. Uh, they might even collect fees for publishing work that undergoes very little editorial scrutiny. So this revelation has called into question the quality of research work by Malaysian universities and higher education's obsession with annual global rankings. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to be looking at some of the root causes uh, for this problem. Our first guest uh, tonight is Professor Zahrum Nain. He's a chairperson of the Malaysian Academics uh, Movement, or better known as GARA. Zahrum, welcome to the show. Um, let's Thanks. begin the conversation Hello. by uh, by with your initial uh, thoughts about this uh, revelation that Malaysia has among the highest number of research publications in predatory journals. What did you make of that? Uh, <laughs> uh, sensationalist, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps local folks ought to conduct a fairly detailed study uh, first to confirm that they are predatory journals, and second to see who are those publishing in them. Are the figures in Malaysia correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great that the folks from ne Netherlands did that study, if I'm not mistaken. But really, uh, I Czech think that more, more, sorry? The Czech Republic. Yeah, uh, Czech Republic, oh yeah, okay. Uh, uh, that, 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 I think that there is a need to, for us to, to seriously address it to see whether that's true or not. I do know there are predator public, uh, publications, predator journals, uh, but uh, are these... Are, are, these, are these all predator journals? That's another thing that needs to be looked at. Now, that's my my first thought. Uh, second, if if uh, if the above is true, then uh, perhaps we ought to start thinking seriously, uh, asking if the numbers are correct, which I suspect they are, uh, and examine the root causes. Then, yeah, uh, because this is I, I feel for for many of us, this is nothing new. Uh, this has happened before. Uh, we've heard of uh, academics who have published in these journals, we've even heard of some, perhaps some departments even encouraging uh, academics to uh, publish in those uh, in those journals, in, yeah, uh, primarily because, well, there are those root causes that we might want to talk about later, yeah. Yeah, before we get to the root causes, Aaron, what about the, the fact that uh, this study uh, also differentiated between different disciplines? So you, you have Malaysia, you know, very high in the rankings uh, for some under some categories and then much lower, not at all in other categories. And uh, we, and also the fact that, um, you know, many of the other countries we compete with are countries in the third world. So Indonesia also uh, was very high in, in, this, in this particular study. Uh, what do you make of those dimensions of the problem? Well, uh, there's, there's one way of looking, there's one particular way of looking at this, uh, those who are critical of this kind of studies. Uh, that they indicate a kind of uh, imperialism, I guess, in the sense that you know uh, that look that in, that third world journals are seen as, uh, or people writing in those journals are seen as, you know, not not as good as those who uh, publish in, in the more recognized journals, uh, and therefore they they're seen as as not of having the same quality. That's just one way of looking at it, and I think. There might be some elements of truth there. I think that's something that we need to, to examine, to, to, to discuss as well, whether this is really a, a, a genuine concern for, for the quality of, of material that's, uh, that's researched and published, or whether it's essentially a, a, a dismissal of many things that are done in the so-called third world. Yeah? Uh, so uh, that, that's one. The other one is, of course, you could say that many of them, uh, if, if they are from the third world, I guess because... Many of the established journals are in English, and uh, many of those in, in, in the third world do not. The, the English is not the first language for many of, many of us. So subsequently, you know, there, there's this fear that uh, to, to publish in those kind of journals as well. There's this reluctance to publish in this kind of, those kind of the high, higher tier journals, perhaps. Yeah. So uh, subsequently, because of, and this is where the causes come in, yeah, because uh, the, the, the notion of publish or, publish, publish or perish has become very, very 
uh, part of KPI now in, in universities uh, because of that. Uh, uh, Zaro, can I get you to explain that, this publish or perish uh, <laughs> mentality? Uh, the idea that if you're an academic, uh, if you are in, in universities, uh, your job is to create knowledge, to essentially expand on knowledge, to come up with new new types of knowledge as well. I mean, you're not in schools, uh, which many of us would argue where we are these days with Malaysian universities, but nonetheless, uh, the idea is essentially to create new knowledge, yeah? and therefore, to create new knowledge, you then have to essentially disseminate that knowledge. Yeah? How do you disseminate those, that knowledge? Essentially, to publish. Yeah? Uh, and therefore, the idea is that if you don't publish, uh, you don't talk about your research, uh, then invariably, uh, you will perish. <laughs> that you, 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 You'll be buried under... Uh, so many insignificant uh, academics who don't do anything of that of that nature. So that that uh, at one stage was 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 seen as a, a kind of redeeming uh, thing where where effectively quality is important. Yeah, but these days uh, because it's become part of many uh, Malaysian universities KPI key performance indexes. Yeah, key performance indexes. Unfortunately, quantity is a key rather than quality. So, uh, yeah, and, and and when you have few top tier journals, as I said before, uh, and many people wanting to get onto the, those journals, and they are there, uh, you know, twice a year or quarterly, then invariably, you know, uh, there won't be enough space in those journals, and there's a long waiting list, which is the way it has been for many many years. Some for years, uh, some for years, some for one and a half years, you wait for your article to be published in those journals. Yeah. So, subsequently, there, because of this, mm -hmm. sorry? Very quickly, I mean, could you just clarify for us? I mean, this is a problem that I imagine, uh, you know, uh, uh, reveals itself both in public and private universities in Malaysia uh, and perhaps around the world, and that it might have to do also with the, the tier that that university is in, right, between the two universities of the world uh, versus the degree mills at the bottom end of that spectrum. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, well, uh, for, 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 for a while, uh, many of the private universities, uh, certainly in Malaysia, focus on teaching, yeah, uh, and even, even among uh, public universities, they are the research universities, or at least those who have been determined of, uh, as, as research universities, and those who are uh, were essentially teaching universities, yeah. So there's greater, greater, greater pressure on the uh, on the research universities to do essentially research and publish, yeah. Uh, and they're given, for well, at least the decades before, they were given uh, large sums of money to to essentially conduct those research, yeah. So uh, one can't say that you know uh, that that the the, the 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 priorities are the same, yeah. Uh, that there they are, like I said, the teaching universities and the research universities. So, uh, Sarum, I, I understand when you say that, you know, to get published in, in a reputable journal, that will take a long time to, for it to be peer-reviewed and, and to be checked mm. and to be published, and there's just simply not enough space. But surely there must be something academically dishonest, intellectually dishonest about paying for your research publication to be published in a uh, questionable uh, platform. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, uh, as far as I know, even some of the more established, uh, especially science journals, uh, you need to pay to, to, to publish in those journals. It's, it's, it's a, it's a money-making thing, essentially, yeah, for, for many of these journals, yeah. Uh, so, it, it's nothing new, but for the, for the newer ones, you pay, but of course, uh, they, they, they don't care about the quality of, of the material you, 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 you publish. I found, for example, one article in, on, on, on Malaysian media in one of those journals that essentially was uh, plagiarized much of my work, my early work, <laughs> with no with no citations whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> and so that's, uh, they, there is no check and balance in that sense. There's no real peer review in many of them. So that that is a problem. But you're paying essentially to be published on those kind of journals in those kind of journals. Uh, right. I mean, is Sarah, yeah. sorry, sorry to interject that, you know, in fact, this uh, question of predatory journals opens up a whole uh, can of worms with regard to the conduct of, um, of you know, tertiary level education institutions, not just in Malaysia, but around the world, uh, oh. you know. But I, I do want to ask you this. I mean, what's happened to the agenda that we saw, you know, that was embarked upon uh, during the Pakatan Harapan administration uh, on reform of universities? Where I know you're one of the p many people who are very uh, um, uh, vociferous in your critique of this, the current situation. Where has that agenda gone? 
Oh, there was an agenda essentially that that that, uh, that Gura had drawn up, right? The the, the ten point agenda that uh, the former minister Masli agreed with and was on on uh, was starting on uh, that agenda. I think is is in the wastefield basket of the present minister, or, 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 <laughs> or has just been that it, there is no agenda as far as I can see of reform uh, under this uh, under this regime. So can okay, you tell us uh, then? A, a little bit about that agenda and how it might resolve some of these problems. Well, the agenda had 10 points, essentially. Yeah? Uh, the proposals we had, essentially, I can name you some offhand, essentially. One was, essentially, to, to allow greater uh, autonomy and independence of universities in terms of uh, the selection of uh, the, 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 the top, top leaders in those universities. I mean, for many, many years, the top leaders and inspected that same... Uh, down that same road again. For many, many years, uh, the leaders, were, the, those academic leaders, the vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellor, and so on and so forth, were political appointees. Yeah. So uh, we said no. We, we 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 ought not to be looking at political appointees. We ought to be looking at you know uh, the, 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 the 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 quality of those those, those people there. Right. Uh, you know, we weren't looking for the Uncle Aziz or Hamza Sindo tonight, but uh, some, <laughs> we were looking for, for that kind of, uh, that, to, to, to hark back to that kind of era, that kind of, kind of quality that was there. Uh, that's one. And essentially to do that, we, we put in place, we, we argued that to do that, you needed a, a, a committee that was an independent committee that would select uh, this, this, uh, this uh, vice chancellors and so on and so forth. As far as I know, that committee was set up, it, it, and, and it's still there now. That, but I can't talk too much about it because there's a, there's right. a court case pending on that. And that, 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 that <laughs> well, Zara, it, if I may bring us back to the uh, predatory yeah. journals in the couple of minutes that we have left very quickly, yeah. I wanted to ask you, what, what measures can be put in place? You talked about check to, checks and balances. How can we increase scrutiny and quality control of research work coming out of Malaysian universities? <sighs> <laughs> That's a big question, right? Uh, what would I see? Well, one would be uh, to dismantle uh, higher education for political interference and appointments. I think that's a, one of the main problems uh, that, 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 that has hit us, yeah? And that's something that needs to be addressed. Second, in relation to that, is greater academic autonomy to discuss politically these developments to help develop a new or even a bigger breed of honest academics with integrity, yeah? Three, there must be emphasis on developing local knowledge and expertise that is critical of borrowed knowledge and willing to move on from there. You don't merely repeat what's been said and done for decades. Uh, we must question that, and we must come up with new, new types of knowledge as well. And third, is to, uh, finally, is to facilitate the growth of students and academics. Facilitate, not police them, uh, as it seems to be continuously done these days. All right. Laram, yes, thank you so much for, for speaking to us on the show tonight. We really do appreciate your time and you sharing your insights. We're going to take a quick break here on Consider This, but we will be back with more on this topic. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. <laughs> Anda inspirasi kami. Welcome aboard. Kami berkongsi saluran-saluran filem berikut. Bila sentuh soal berita, tiada masa untuk tunggu. Kepada anda kami bawakan fakta, susulan dan kupasan yang terkini. Tiada drama dan tiada pengulangan. Usah tunggu lama-lama. Awan 745. Lebih awal dari biasa. Kini berwajah baru. Ini pula susulan khas pesawat back air di Kazakhstan. Pesawat berkenaan dilaporkan tergelincir dua kali. Notifikasi berita terkini dan navigasi mudah. Podcast dikemas kini dengan berita dan program. Riba. Reformasi, resistance and hope. Serta video tanpa hard dengan scroll tanpa henti. Buat turun aplikasi baru Astro Awani sekarang.
Gagalan Kerajaan Persekutuan Tunai Janji melaksanakan projek baik pulih sekolah daif turut diulas Menteri Muda Pendidikan dan Penyelidikan Teknologi Dr. Anwar Rapai. COVID-19, dua lagi kes di Syaki atau PUI direkodkan di Sarawak. So, hopefully kita akan mendapat kedudukan yang lebih baik di masa-masa akan datang. Udang geragau atau bubuk dalam bahasa tempatan terkenal sebagai bahan utama dalam pembuatan belacan atau cincaluk. Amanah di tangan kita Adat, budaya dan semangat Menjadi kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang terkenal Hello, if you've just joined us, you're watching Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me is Sharad Kutin, and we're continuing our look at the underlying reasons why Malaysia has been found to have an embarrassingly high number of scholarly publications in what they call predatory journals. Joining us on the line now, we have Dr. Islam Zakaria. She's a senior lecturer with Birmingham University. Uh, Birmingham Business School at uh, University of Birmingham in the UK, formerly the CEO of the Malaysian think tank, The Centre. Idlan, um, good evening. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Now, I want to get your uh, initial reactions. What did you make of that report that Malaysia had uh, has the, high, the fifth highest uh, number of academic publications uh, in predatory journals? Hi, uh, hi Melissa. Hi, Shrad. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, my initial reaction was I was disappointed, but I wasn't surprised because um, the existence of predatory journals has really kind of not been a secret in, in um, you know, academia, but I was a bit disappointed to see Malaysia quite high up on, on that list. But, but to put that into context as well, predatory journals are quite hard to spot because because if you look in the paper, the, the Czech paper that was being um, quoted, they, they, they went into great um, deliberation in trying to find what these these um, predatory journals and predatory papers look like. So, so I suppose my, my bigger question here would be, um, is there any kind of support for, for you know academic staff in identifying these predatory journals? Because we use systems like Scopus, etc. But clearly it's not the arbiter that um, it's meant to be because it's gone through this whole system as well. And I guess for me, um, the way that I think about this is that we are here now, right? Uh, we're stuck here. We, we, are, we are in this situation. What do we do? And this is a question not just, you know, for Malaysian academics, but for um, the global academic community as well. Where, where do we move from here to kind of stem this predatory journal problem? Uh, Ilan, do you think part of the problem is that, um, you know, one is the massification of higher education, just the sheer number of uh, universities now uh, around the globe offering PhD programs, uh, and but, you know, all kind of funneled now through still maybe a, a much uh, a smaller uh, uh, list of you know p platforms in which they could publish and be recognized for that work I mean is that part of the problem just the scale of university education globally and the number of PhDs being produced I think I think the number of PhDs being produced is that but that much of an issue as much as the quality of the PhDs being produced right I'm all for having as many universities out there, provide, um, you know, producing as many PhDs if it means that there is an advancement of knowledge. But if, there are, if this creates shortcuts in, in the way that they are doing things, then that is obviously quite problematic. But there is a, something that is probably not quite um, addressed as much, is the Western hegemony on, on good journals, right? The West, um, this idea that getting into... Um, or getting into a Western journal is that an English-speaking journal. There are a number of um, kind of native language journals in Japanese, in Korean, in Chinese, for example, or in Arabic, who, which are also of good quality, but they don't get as much coverage. So, so we kind of aspire to get into the good top English journals, and that is hard because getting into the good journals is is is, is not easy, and it's not as apolitical or as objective as you think. There is a little game that is being played 
Um, and, and I think it is this game that is being exploited by, by predatory journals. And then this is kind of um, appended, I guess, to a certain extent by um, unrealistic targets of, of um, that are being set for some academics right. to publish. I like, it's, it's, I like that you brought that up, Idlan, about, about the, you know, predatory journals are just exploiting a gap in the market. They see an opportunity this, and they, they, they've seized it. But I like what you brought up about the, unrealistic, the, the pressures on, um, on, on academics, perhaps here in Malaysia particularly, uh, to publish. And that's often tied into promotions and, you know, academic, um, uh, the way that the promotion structure is, the promotion system is structured. There is so much pressure on academics to publish. And uh, we spoke to Zarum a little bit earlier who said that, you know, it's publish or perish. Um, how do we dismantle that systemic problem? I think one of the first things we need to kind of acknowledge is the fact that um, publishing is one of the many pillars that are taken into consideration with, with when it comes to promotion. So, so I mean, in Malaysian universities and even in um, universities that I've been affiliated with um, in the UK and in the that I work for, it's not the only thing that, that they look at. But um, it is one of the major things that people are, are quite um, obsessed with. With because it is something that is probably a little bit more within their control. Because if you are waiting for, let's say, one of the types of promotion is like um, an appointment or, or validation from an external body, right? You don't really quite easily get valid. You can't get the ministry to come and call you up um, to basically become, you know, a, a panel member. But you could definitely control the number of articles that you produce or how you teach, for example. But then this kind of leads on with this um, point about KPIs that are within this promotion culture that I, I, I find them um, a little bit disturbing. Uh, when I was in Malaysia last year and, and um, a little bit before that, I, I kind of compared notes with some of my colleagues because uh, my, my kind of KPI is to basically have approximately three or four papers um, within a year, right? Uh, sorry, within five years, my apologies, right? And then I compare it with them and... Uh, I'll give you an example of one, one, one of my colleagues at an IPTA um, in Malaysia. It's required to publish seven papers a year, plus get some grant funding to the tune of maybe 100,000 ringgit, plus make sure that at least two master's students or one PhD student graduates, plus prepare some teaching innovation stuff things, right? And you have all these things coming into that. And, and I'm only going to speak right, to my subject area. I'm not quite sure what it works like in in um, other subject areas, but in my subject area, to get a paper in a good journal, the turnaround period is about between 18 months to three years. So if you have there a market for a wow. journal that says that I can get you this within a year, right? Idlan, is it, is it possible that what, what the problems that we're having is that these KPIs are being set uh, by people who are not academics, who actually have no understanding of the world of academia and uh, and how these processes might be, partly because of the demand of universities to corporatize and to mimic, you know, corporate style uh, KPI systems. Could that be one of the problems? I think it's not completely unlinked um, because some of the VCs or the, the management of, of the universities were academics themselves. But I think what is the more important nuance here is that every subject area is different. And that doesn't really translate particularly well. So if you were, for example, working for a, a paper in the sciences, having 20, 20 names on a paper is probably very much acceptable because you are working in the lab. Right? Some of the Nobel Prize winning papers have got 50 authors on the paper. And yet, for a social science area, if you have more than three names on a paper, people start asking you, what is the incremental contribution of the additional author, for example? Right. So every subject area needs these kind of nuances, blanket KPIs that don't reflect the reality of subject-level nuances. There are some subjects, for example, that value more book chapters, right? So they value book chapters, but they don't value journals as much. But that's not visible. So that, I think, needs to change. Uh, can I come back to that example, Idlan, that you, you gave a little bit earlier about the need to publish seven mm -hmm. papers and, and find gr uh, grant funding and uh, you know, pa uh, get PhD students uh, to graduate? That seems like an enormous burden uh, on academic staff uh, here in Malaysia. Is there a reason that, is it a lack of, of uh, 
resources, human resources, that they've got to do so much compared to, say, uh, peers overseas? Um, I think it's, I, I sort of think, okay, this is a theory, okay, and I, I can't substantiate this as an academic, I'm going to catch that caveat right out, right? Um, <laughs> That's part right. Of it is also, <laughs> part of it is also driven by metrics that are put into university rankings, right? So 32.5% of university ranking scores are driven by citations, okay? So, so again, you know, so, so that there's that kind of drive, right? And if you think about it from universities overseas, Universities overseas are so much more well established. The culture, the academic culture, has been has been around for maybe you know at least 100, 150 years, some even older, and they've created, uh, cultivated this culture of research that has been you know more supportive of this kind of activity over time. We can't just manufacture this within um, you know a number of years by just providing KPIs um, you know to to to, to this extent. I, what I was telling you was these were the um, what my, my my colleagues shared were the counted KPIs. There's also the other kind of stuff, the administrative stuff that they have to do. But they, there isn't equal support for them to do this. You want me to write seven papers, brilliant, but don't give me a ton of teaching to do as well, right? Right. Can I ask you? To, yeah. Right. So I can just sort of uh, ask you about you know where. The, the whole the whole question of universities in Malaysia and this uh, you know this master plan by successive governments to turn it into a business. Basically, we want to get into the global business of providing tertiary level education, uh, and we you know I think the the number of uh, foreign students was pegged at one hundred seventy thousand or two hundred twenty thousand, something around that order of attracting these people to uh, to spend money and education in institutions in Malaysia. Is that skewing? The, the question of academic culture and, put, you know, slowly building the kind of value system that you say undergrid other universities in, in different parts of the world? I think that making universities as a, as a business, I think, um, is, is problematic anyway from, from, a, from my own kind of philosophical point of view. But if you are going to be a business, you have to decide what kind of business you're going to be. Right? Not, uh, we're not going to become the next Harvard in 10 years. We're not going to be able to attract the caliber of Harvard students in 10 years. But then we need to ask ourselves, is the caliber of students that we are attracting now the caliber of students we want? Because the action that we are taking seems to be resulting in these, right? This master plan, this, this kind of corporatization of, of a public good, essentially, which is what education is. So, so that kind of, you know, we, we, we kind of, we can't just jump on the bandwagon and copy what other people are doing because it worked for them. They took a long time. These things took a long time to percolate for these institutions, for other people overseas. You can't compare Malaysian universities or emerging economy universities with, with, um, with, with universities that have been established and also are actually kind of um, key players in the hegemony of, of the education, the world education um, system in itself. Right. Well, Idlan, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show and helping us think through this really complex issue, what seemed to be, you know, I think we've, we've kind of gone beyond the headlines of just Malaysia's <laughs> ranking when it comes to predatory journals and discuss the wider, um, the, the underlying causes. And I will appreciate you uh, coming on the show and sharing those insights. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having Let's, me. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun signing off for the evening. Uh, and uh, don't forget to get all the latest news and uh, information on COVID-19 uh, vaccines at the uh, Astro Awani website, astroawani.com or the Astro Awani app. That's all we have for you for tonight. Thank you so much for watching and good night. <laughs>